welcome everyone. It's so nice to see you all here. This is our first time to use this new uh, beautiful UMRATH lounge for our purposes. Um, I'm Marie Griffith. I'm the director of the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. And uh, welcome to our first public lecture of this academic year. It's great to see a lot of new faces here from different institutions, so welcome to you all. Uh, some of you may know that since we last had public events, we've now moved into this building. So I hope at some point you'll take a moment to uh, see our new headquarters just across the hall here in the lovely, beautifully renovated um, Umbreath Hall. Uh, I want to make sure you all know that our next lecture of this year will feature George Will uh, from the Washington Post, among other places. And he will speak on December 4th in Graham Chapel. It's an evening lecture. Uh, he'll be speaking at 7 p.m. that evening. Uh, let me also announce that following today's lecture, we're going to have an informal reception there at the back of the room. So please feel free to stay for refreshments and conversation uh, with our speaker and with um, other folks here as well. It is my great pleasure now to introduce Charles Marsh who is Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Project on Lived Theology at the University of Virginia. Uh, Professor Marsh is a graduate of Gordon College, Harvard Divinity School, and the University of Virginia, where he earned his PhD in 1989. Uh, the Project on Lived Theology is a research community that seeks, among other things, to understand the social consequences of social beliefs. Uh, it's really much more than that. Um, and I hope and expect that he will tell us more about this uh, during his lecture or the subsequent uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. Professor Marsh is a prolific writer and the author of a range of works at the intersection of cultural, historical, and theological inquiry. From his first scholarly book, Reclaiming Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Promise of His Theology, which Oxford University Press published in 1994, uh, to his most recent book, which was co-authored with his lifelong friend and the civil rights activist, John Perkins, a book called Welcoming Justice, God's Movement Toward Beloved Community, which was published by InterVarsity Press in the fall of 2009. So already you see the range of uh, figures and of topics and themes in Professor Marsh's work. He's also done a favor for all of us born and bred Southern evangelicals by considering the religious and moral paradoxes of his own Southern Protestant upbringing, and in particular the complex ways theological commitments and convictions came into dramatic conflict in the civil rights movement in the American South. The religious beliefs and social practices of ordinary people of faith illuminated a new way of writing, for, of writing theology for him, the first fruit being God's Long Summer, Stories of Faith and Civil Rights, published by Princeton University Press in 1997. Um, this was a groundbreaking book that many of us in the field of American religious history teach over and over again, and it won the 1998 Grawemeyer Award in Religion. His memoir, The Last Days, A Son's Story of Sin and Segregation at the Dawn of a New South, published by Basic Books in 2001, is a coming-of-age account of a minister's son in a small Mississippi town that was home to the white knights of the Ku Klux Klan. His 2005 book, The Beloved Community, How Faith Shapes Social Justice from the Civil Rights Movement to Today, also published by Basic, developed a new interpretation of the civil rights movement based on Martin Luther King Jr.'s remark that the end of the movement is not the protest, the end is not the boycott, the end is redemption, reconciliation, and the creation of beloved community. In 2007, Professor Marsh wrote a theological analysis of the Christian rights support of the presidency of George W. Bush entitled, Wayward Christian Soldiers, Freeing the Gospel of Political Cact Captivity, from political captivity. Uh, again, Oxford University Press published that one in 2007, and it was excerpted in a variety of places. Um, and it's a book, Wayward Christian Soldiers, that really shares a great deal in common with Senator Danforth's own book, Faith and Politics. Uh, so we uh, have a lot of shared things there. 
Marsh is the recipient of many awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship in the Creative uh, Arts, and he has served at the American Academy of Berlin. The book he's currently writing is called Strange Glory, A Life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which will be published by Knopf uh, uh, shortly in 2014. He's also a member and a very valued member of the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics Advisory Board, our National Advisory Board. So we're very, very uh, grateful for his service there. His lecture today is titled Redeeming the Soul of America, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King Jr., and The Promise of the Engaged Scholar. Please join me in welcoming Professor Charles Marsh. Thank you so, so much for that lovely introduction, uh, Marie, and um, thanks to all of you here at the Danforth Center um, for making my visit such a lovely time and for all of your extraordinary hospitality and for this beautiful weather. And thanks to you for coming inside on such a beautiful afternoon. Um, so I am happy to be back here. This is my second visit to um, Washington University and to the Danforth Center. Um, I invite you to um, join me this afternoon in sort of a journey through two lives. My lecture will run about 50 minutes, OK? So that's warning to you. Um, I, I've already handed out some chocolates, and I'm out of the chocolates, so um, there's nothing else to do there. And I hope we have some time, we will have some time uh, at the end to pick up any questions or, or, or loose threads or anything about these two figures that aren't covered in my lecture. So, redeeming the soul of America with a question mark. <laughs> Bonhoeffer King and the Promise of the Engaged Scholar. During a seminar at Harvard Divinity School in 1967 on religion and politics, the theologian and visiting professor Helmut Thielicke was asked about the popular criticism that the social movements of the 1960s and the civil rights movement in particular had produced merely symbolic solutions to the pressing issues of the day. At most, the door has been opened only a crack, one student said. The response of this German dissident and radical pastor took the class off guard. So what, he said. What do you have against symbolic solutions? Tilika went on to say that while we grasp onto the big programmatic searchlights and try desperately, even courageously, to, to light up the road a long way ahead, the prospect of living with a symbolic solution may well remind us that despite all of our best efforts, we shall nev never bring about the kingdom. <laughs> what a fascinating exchange and provocative introduction to, to our considerations this afternoon. Redeeming the soul of America? <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. and the promise of the engaged scholar. Sorry. What an absurdly ambitious title, I realized shortly after sending it to Marie, even with the question mark. And besides, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther King Jr. are not two figures commonly associated with symbolic measures. These two theologian, pastor, activists reckoned with the fierce urgency of the here and now one contesting the hellishly real structures of Southern segregation and the other, the monstrous Nazi state. They sought redemption in its most vivid and concrete forms. What then do we make of this tension between the floodlights and the flickering lamps that illuminate just the, the next step or maybe the step after that? Between the, 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 the striving for the promised land and the wilderness wanderings where we usually end up. As I have made the journey from a childhood in the segregated South, the child of a Southern Baptist minister, uh, a, a child who came of age, as Marie mentioned, during the most violent years of the uh, civil rights movement, during the reign of, of a white Christian terrorist organization of the light, uh, late 1960s, as I, as I have tried to deal with the uh, haunting and perplexing questions of the time, 
I have found that the most compelling answers come most often when I cleave to stories. <laughs> and always, my thoughts have returned to the lives and, if you will, the witnesses of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther King Jr., not only as exceedingly helpful guides in navigating the complex realities of our own era, but as exemplars of engaged scholarship who offer us fresh and exceedingly generous ways of thinking about faith and its social energies. So in my talk uh, this afternoon, I wish to connect their stories, or to try to connect their stories, and what I hope are inspiring and generative ways. And at some point near the end, we might, we might have a closer look at, at the phrase that titles this lecture and remember the question mark. Well, most of you know something about the life and legacy of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, you've seen uh, a lot of attention to recent biographies in the press and on the television. Uh, less familiar, perhaps, than the story of his involvement in the resistance and in the conspiracy against Hitler are his journeys and encounters in America in 1930 and 31, and then again briefly in 1939. The former, however, will figure more prominently into our considerations this afternoon. In the late summer of 1930, Dietrich Bonhoeffer came to Union Theological Seminary in New York City as a visiting student and a postdoctoral fellow. He arrived in Manhattan as a straight arrow academic whose, whose star was on the rise. He was a 24 year old privat docent at the University of Berlin, the great theological faculty in Europe, uh, with two doctoral dissertations under his belt, ready for a lifetime of, of academic accomplishments and, and the rich rewards of, of, of the German guild. A lack of self-confidence was not then or ever a problem for this golden child of the Berlin Grunewald. But when he left New York uh, 10 months later, he left with dramatically transformed ideas on social engagement, faith, and historical responsibility. In his definitive biography, uh, 1,100 pages, I think with notes, Eberhard Baker describing this return to Germany said simply, something had happened. <laughs> well, let's ask what happened briefly. The best place to start is to take a brief inventory of Bonhoeffer's life on the eve of his first, first visit to America. What did he expect of his year? Looking at his notes and letters written on the eve of his journey, it seems clear that he expected the time to be yet another beautiful chapter in his very charmed life. As I said, he was a 24-year-old theological prodigy who had, in his second dissertation, sought to deconstruct the tradition, the entire tradition of Kantian transcendental subjectivity. What could he possibly learn from a country, he said, where people fashioned their religion the way they ordered a car from the factory? according to taste and preference. However, there, there is a hint of, I think, more intimate hopes found in a somewhat unlikely source, and indulge me briefly on this. It comes from an essay on choosing text for preaching penned during a comprehensive exam at Berlin. Bonhoeffer says that one promising theme for a sermon series is God's path through history in the Church of Christ. And the first text he mentions for this series is Hebrews 12.1, the verse that culminates the saga of faith from creation to the first martyrs in chapter 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. The verse seemed to have deep importance for Bonhoeffer, though it would take some months before he understood how. And indeed, five months after he'd been in America, as he experienced a new country, an unfamiliar culture, the strange and to him sometimes very exotic landscapes of American life, 
he wrote to a friend and said, I am searching for a cloud of witnesses. And the 12 courses he took at Union Theological Seminary as a Sloan Fellow, Bonhoeffer focused on philosophy of religion, theology and ethics, and an educational context and theological climate altogether different from the sort he was accustomed to in Berlin. Suffice it to say, he was underwhelmed by the theological world encountered at the great Protestant seminary on the Upper West Side. Nothing, nothing but religion and ethics was one of his more generous <laughs> remarks. And Bonhoeffer's observations at the end of the year are no less critical than on that day in the, in the start of the fall semester, 1930, when he couldn't believe it, he recoiled in outrage as fellow seminarians started giggling during his presentation on Martin Luther's great doctrine of the justification by faith. It has come to this, Bonhoeffer complained, that the seminary has forgotten what Christian theology in its very essence stands for. The principal doctrines here are in utter disarray. In America, he said, it would appear that it is possible to enter the ministry without having a clue what one believes. <laughs> Yet amidst all this hand-wringing over theology, Union style or American style, we should not lose sight of the fact that, that Bonhoeffer in Berlin had already begun to feel boxed in by institutional constraints and the, like, the lack of a vital connection between the classroom and the world. Complaining loudly and often, as you'll see in his notes, about the German Academy. In one um, entry in his journal, he writes in his almost illegible longhand, I'm supposed to be intellectually creative while grading these excruciatingly dumb seminar papers? <laughs> and he says lots of other things as well. I think the larger context of Bonhoeffer's remarks, agitated remarks, suggests that he had grown impatient with a certain insular and for him suffocating uh, preoccupation of his, uh, in his academic life. He traveled to America in search of a cloud of witnesses for some relief <laughs> from the Lutheran melancholy of the North German plains. <laughs> Bonhoeffer never met anyone quite like Reinhold Niebuhr the great dramatist of theological ideas in the public arena, as Larry Rasmussen has nicely said, for whom probing analysis of the contemporary situation and existential engagement in its needs and conflicts appeared more important for theology than parsing sacred doctrines. Among a faculty of nearly 40 at this flagship institution of American Protestantism, no one better represented American social theology than this indefatigable a teacher, still only two years away from his pastorate in inner city Detroit. In the concept of Christian realism, which Niebuhr was actually working out in his lectures and seminars the year Bonhoeffer was there, 1930-31, and um, would be the most widely quoted term from his 1932 landmark book, Moral Man and Immoral Society, Niebuhr reminded modern believers, and all persons, believer or not, of their thick entanglement in the broken and indeed sinful, he would remind liberals, structures of the world. Christian realism began with the sober affirmation that there will never be any final escape in historic existence from the contradictions in which human nature is involved. Niebuhr's honest assessments of power and justice struck a chord with people searching for a way beyond liberal idealism and Victorian quietism, beyond utopianism and resignation. And Bonhoeffer took courses both semesters with Niebuhr. And while he enjoyed the courses, especially Niebuhr's ethical viewpoints in modern literature in which Bonhoeffer was um, introduced to the writings of James Weldon Johnson, Booker T. Washington, W.E.D. Du Bois, he found Niebuhr's views positively bewildering. One day after class, he approached his professor and asked, is this a seminary or a training center for politicians? <laughs> but Niebuhr was equally perplexed by the 
Lutheran prodigy from Berlin. And as you know, Niebuhr was not one to shy away from confrontation. When Bonhoeffer asserted in a term paper that the God of guidance could only be known from the God of justification, Niebuhr responded sharply that your doctrine of grace is far too transcendent. It has no bearing on the concrete here and now. Niebuhr pushed Bonhoeffer to think more honestly, more realistically, about the ethical content and social significance of the doctrine of justification by faith. In making grace as transcendent as you do, Niebuhr told Bonhoeffer, I don't see how you can ascribe any ethical or practical significance to it. Obedience to God must issue in actions which can be socially valued. Bonhoeffer never acknowledged a theological debt to Niebuhr, although the two would become uh, very good friends over the next decade. And Niebuhr, as many of you know, would offer Bonhoeffer asylum in New York in 1939 and would visit um, in Germany um, on, on a number of occasions. Nevertheless, I think it is correct to say that Bonhoeffer was, was moved and inspired by the spirit of, of Niebuhr's public theology in particular by a theologian who engaged the social order with ultimate honesty you know, and uh, civil courage, terms that Bonhoeffer later used, who insisted that the scholarly enterprise required maximum attention to race, politics, literature, issues of social justice, citizenship, and the complex realities of the day. More uh, influential, though, I think, than his exchanges with Niebuhr, with Niebuhr were um, experiences in and outside the classroom in New York with representatives of what we might call the, the, the great American organizing tradition. I refer here to the tradition of Protestant, uh, progressive Protestant thought characterized by the commitment to piecemeal social reform and the disciplines of community building and organizing. Richard Rorty, the philosopher, um, called this the, the, the reformist left in his Harvard Massey lectures published in the superb um, volume, very short but wonderful uh, book, Achieving Our Country, Leftist Thought in 20th Century America. But bless his heart, Richard Rorty, Professor Rorty, allowed not a word of these men and women's deep religious convictions. Since Niebuhr, or, uh, Niebuhr's arrival in Union in 1928, a cadre of social reformers had turned to him for moral and financial support. And time and again, Niebuhr, uh, Niebuhr offered it graciously. In his marvelous book, um, uh, it's not Niebuhr's, but a book by Tony Anthony Dunbar called Against the Grain, Southern Radicals and Prophets, 1929 to 1959, uh, this sort of, um, um, lay uh, historian Anthony Dunbar, who now writes mystery novels, uh, detective novels based in New Orleans, um, says that without Niebuhr's inspiration and practical assistance, these, these movements probably would not have existed or succeeded to the extent that they did. Niebuhr's encouraging presence and his logistical expertise are pervasive in the letters and exchanges of the intentional communities and the progressive social and congregational initiatives flourishing in this remarkable fertile period of, of uh, American uh, Protestant um, thought. Bonhoeffer's knowledge of this American organ organizing tradition came directly through his studies with two great teachers, several great teachers at Union, including um, Harry Ward and Charles Weber and firsthand participation in their classes in local church-based organizing. And Bonhoeffer's knowledge of this tradition deepened in friendships with classmates at Union, many of whom, after finishing their degree, some before finishing, dispersed into backwater towns and urban areas and um, um, uh, 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 strange hamlets throughout the Deep South to pursue their, their social ministries. Unfortunately, I, in, in this afternoon's talk, I, I can't possibly do justice to these, these, these largely forgotten scholars. But I would recommend for your fall reading, um, in addition to the above-sided uh, Against the Grain, two books. Um, one by Frank Adams called James A. Dombrowski, An American Heretic, 
and the other by uh, the late David Nelson Duke, uh, a wonderful book called In the Trenches with Jesus and Marx, Harry F. Ward, and the Struggle for Social Justice. Um, David Duke was actually researching this whole area when he um, sadly died of, of cancer 10 years ago. He was teaching at a Baptist college in Missouri. Charles Weber was a pastor, organizer, but I'll say a word about Weber, was a pastor, organizer, professor of practical theology at Union, and author of the book, A History of the Development of Social Education in the United Neighborhood Houses in New York. His course, Church and Community, which Bonhoeffer took in the fall semester, resembled what um, some of us call these days a service learning initiative, though it was, it was more than that. Weber used the course to introduce seminarians to the lived theologies of a city in the throes of, of economic distress, one year into the Depression, and to the impressive displays of social ministries flourishing throughout the, uh, New York. He arranged site visits for the, for the class, and Bonhoeffer could hardly believe his eyes, accompanied the students, never happened in Berlin, as they journeyed from the Union Quadrangle to take part in organizing initiatives based in churches and synagogues. Bonhoeffer wrote at the end of the year, in connection with his course, I paid a visit almost every week to one of these character building agencies, settlements, YMCA, home missions, cooperative houses, playgrounds, children's courts, night schools, socialist schools, asylums, youth organizations, advancement for, uh, national advancement um, for colored people. This is language. It is immensely impressive to see how much personal self-sacrifice is achieved with how much devotion, energy, and sense of responsibility the work is done. The, student, the students all visited the National Women's Trade Union League and the Workers' Educational Bureau of America. They discussed, as Bonhoeffer said, labor problems, restriction to profits, civil rights, juvenile crime, and the activity of the churches in these fields. Study the role of the churches in selective buying campaigns and public policies, drawing on models uh, gleaned from the Southern Tenants Farm Workers Union, the Delta Cooperative. They met with officials from the American Civil Liberties Union, the nation, nation's premier um, defender of civil, civil liberties, which after its founding in 1920, had focused heavily on the rights of conscientious objectors and the protection of resident aliens from deportation. And when Bonhoeffer returned to Berlin in the summer of 1931, he told one of his brothers that we will need an ACLU of our own. Through his field work with Charles Weber, you know, this, this largely forgotten professor of, of practical theology, Bonhoeffer saw illuminated a pathway from the theological classroom to the concrete social situation. And many of the phrases of American social theology began to pepper his um, le lectures and writings and books. In his personal recollection of Bonhoeffer's year in the United States, Hans Christoph von Hasse, Bonhoeffer's cousin, said that so, so Dietrich learned so much in America, more than he probably realized. He learned something that was missing in German theology, the grounding of theology in reality. This circle of Christian social reformers, which Bonhoeffer joined at Union, also included the engaged scholars John King Gordon, William Klein, and Gaylord White, and as I mentioned above, James Dombrowski and Miles Horton. And among this company of white Southern dissidents, let us also remember Howard Buck Hester and Sherwood Eddy, Lillian Smith, Jesse Daniel Ames, Lucy Randolph Macon, all of whom became familiar to Bonhoeffer in those years. But let me just say a quick word about Miles Horton, a country boy born from the riverboat town of Savannah, Tennessee, and Someone who surely represents a, a theological student, a type of, of, of seminarian, uh, um, inconceivable to Bonhoeffer before his, his year in America. Horton grew up in rural poverty of the sort documented by James Agee and Walker Evans in their landmark volume, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. He was educated at Cumberland College, a school set up for poor, poor whites in Appalachia, and spent many of his summers working in vacation Bible schools and in the, the mountains of East Tennessee. He later said in an interview that the only reason he was um, 
ever admitted to Union was because the seminary was looking for a token hillbilly. <laughs> While the aristocratic Berliner regarded Union as sophomoric, Horton felt intimidated by the extremely high, he said, intellectual level at Union and remained always mindful of, of his educational and cultural background. Well, in 1932, this, this, if not token, at least certainly holy hillbilly, returned to East Tennessee to set up an experimental school for educating for fundamental social change. And this experiment, the Highlander Folk School, emerged as one of the most influential training centers in the um, eastern seaboard, equipping southern workers with skills for labor organizing and helping launch the Congress of Industrial Organizations. In the 1950s, under Miles Horton's direction, Highlander turned its attention from labor to the burgeoning civil rights movement and helped train a generation of church-based organizers that included such brilliant theological activists as uh, Ella Baker, um, Rosa Parks, and Martin Luther King Jr. These representatives of the American organizing tradition pressed Bonhoeffer to re-examine his understanding of the theological and scholarly vocation. And these men and women must surely be counted among the greater cloud of witnesses, which Bonhoeffer went in pursuit. Still, nowhere in his first American encounters is the, I love this phrase, the turning from the phraseological to the real, as, as he would later describe this experience, rendered more vividly than in his intense involvement in African-American um, Christian spirituality and in the churches of Harlem, to which I now turn briefly. Frank Fisher was the son of a black Baptist minister in Birmingham and had been assigned to the Abyssinian Baptist Church as a pastoral intern. Uh, Frank Fisher's invitation to this young German to join him one Sunday morning at Abyssinian marked the beginning of an intense six-month immersion in the African-American church. In time, uh, Bonhoeffer, in his fine tailored suits and silk ties, began teaching a Sunday school class for boys and a Wednesday evening women's Bible study, and he began to assist in various youth clubs. And on at least one occasion, he was invited to preach in the pulpit of the venerable uh, Adam Clayton Powell, Sr. Miles Horton, vividly recalled an exchange with Bonhoeffer uh, on a Sunday just after he had returned from one of his first visits to Abyssinian. And Horton says, uh, said Bonhoeffer was, was excited and, and talkative, and instead of going to his room, he described the preaching with great enthusiasm and the audience participation, and especially the singing of the spirituals. He was very emotional and, and did not try to hide his feelings, which was a, quite rare for him. He said it was the only time he had experienced real religion in the United States and was convinced that it was only among the oppressed that there could be any revival in this nation. Not to be overlooked, Bonhoeffer's presence at Abyssinian in 1930-31 coincided with significant transformations in Powell's understanding as a minister in an urban parish. Adam Clayton Powell Sr. had been the senior minister at uh, the historic church since 1908. He was an eloquent preacher and a skilled administrator. But as the depression began to sweep over his Harlem parish, he was inspired to new convictions as a pastor and citizen. In his lovely short memoir, Upon This Rock, he said he began to see Jesus differently, to imagine Jesus no longer as a transcendent reality. His, his words, powerful but inaccessible. But to see Jesus as, a, as someone who wandered the streets of Harlem, someone who shared the struggles of the poor as friend and counselor. And Powell invited the young German theologian into the full life of the congregation. Paul Lehman, some of you know, have heard of, an affable Midwesterner fellow student and later professor of Christian ethics at Union, worried that Bonhoeffer was spending too much time in Harlem. <laughs> as early as October, 
uh, Boniford signed up for a, ne a trip to Negro centers of life and culture. He secured a large bibliography of the Negro compiled by the Harlem branch of the New York Public Library. And he read articles on the NAACP, legal aspects of race. He immersed himself in all the uh, energies and uh, discoveries of the Harlem Renaissance. It was, Lehman said, as if he had forged a remarkable kind of identity with the Negro community. And on Thanksgiving 1930, Bonifer joined Frank Fisher and his relatives in Washington, D.C., where he uh, had great southern food, and even though Washington isn't particularly southern, the family was from the Deep South, and he spoke with a, um, a group of African-American intellectuals based at Howard University. And in the spring of 1931, Bonifer took a long road trip that went to Chicago and to many other cities on the way back to New York with his fellow classmate, the Frenchman Jean Lasserre, who um, was very active in the French resistance. I'd love to talk about him later. And it was a road trip that took the men, as I said, from New York to, Saint, uh, to Chicago and yet yeah, to St. Louis, where Bonhoeffer in his journal, um, this is Bonhoeffer, said after a meeting with some faculty at a Lutheran seminary nearby um, that he had just rubbed against the most unbearable kind of exclusive orthodoxy. This is Bonifer in this journal. <laughs> and he said a lot of other unkind things as well. But um, <laughs> under New Orleans, Fort Worth, and Laredo, Texas, and after a, 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 wee, a, a long train trip down to Mexico City, he drove through the Deep South along old Highway 11 from New Orleans through Hattiesburg, Laurel, Meridian, Birmingham, Knoxville, and the mining towns of West, Western Virginia back on their way to New York. 4,000 miles in an old beat-up car in, in, in uh, seven weeks and an additional 1,200 um, miles um, on Mexican trains. And it appears that somewhere um, in the Deep South, he stopped and attended a service at an African-American church in some rural uh, area and wrote in his journal that here in the church of the outcast of America, he had heard the gospel preached. The conditions are re really rather unbelievable. Separate railway cars, tramways, buses south of Washington. When I wanted to eat in a small restaurant with a Negro, I was refused service. He drove through Alabama the same month nine young black men were accused of raping two white women on a freight train and convicted in a mob atmosphere in successive trials in Scottsboro, Alabama. Scottsboro would have been about a 20-mile detour off Highway 11. In the Church of the Outcasts of America, he said he found a faith that was robust and resilient enough to resist the idols. Back in Berlin, he fell in love with the Bible. <laughs> Two doctorates in theology had no interest in the Bible, but now he fell in love with the Bible and began nurturing her rich devotional life, often animated by the Negro spirituals and the gospel standards. He organized spiritual retreats, sometimes held at his hut in the forest near Brenau, and he encouraged his students to read scripture with an openness to God's voice and with attention to the oppressed and the reviled. He was drawn into an intense devotional reading of the Sermon on the Mount while affirming at the same time the importance of the Christian religion's rootedness in Judaism and the Hebrew Bible. The young philosophical theologian who had found American social theology an offense to doctrinal correctness became the theologian of concreteness. And of course, within two months of the 1933 Aryan Laws, Bonhoeffer had drafted public documents condemning the edict, punctuating his opposition with the claim that he who does not cry out for the Jew may not sing Gregorian chants. Well, what became of his friend Frank Fisher? I'd love to talk about that in the Q&A in more detail, but after graduating from Union, Fisher taught at Morehouse College for a spell before accepting the call in 1948 to the West Hunter Baptist Church in Atlanta, where he remained until his death in 1960, 
at the age of 51. And in January of 1957, Frank Fisher was arrested with 100 ministers from the Law, Love, and Liberation movement, the so-called Triple L um, campaign, for sitting in the whites-only section of Atlanta city buses. Martin Luther King Jr., who was still in 1957 in Montgomery, and Frank Fisher soon became soul travelers in the Southern freedom struggle. And the same year, 1957, combined their energies in forming the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which gathered, uh, gathered around the bold mission to redeem the soul of America. Atlanta's public transportation would not be desegregated for another two years, but, but its campaign, like this ambitious new agenda of the SCLC, had been based on the remarkable success of the Montgomery bus boycott. The, the thing is, however, I should say that while the Montgomery boycott had been a remarkable success, it had not been about redeeming the soul of America at least not in the sense in which LCLC's preacherly vanguard would, would soon embark upon a social justice revival to the nation. Let's talk about that for a minute. You know, my students are um, very often surprised to learn that, that Dr. King, actually not even Dr. King in 1954, but ABD, all but dissertation <laughs> King, came to Montgomery in that spring, uh, momentous spring of 1954, Civil rights activism was not on his list of priorities. He came to Montgomery because it offered a nice salary, um, highly educated congregation, and a comfortable and soon to be renovated parsonage and a new organ in the church. Most members of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the church of called King, had no interest in racial crusading either. Uh, King had been given an earful about the embarrassments and the vexations which his predecessor at Dexter, Vernon Johns, had heaped upon the congregation. Johns, a brilliant erudite classic scholar from Virginia educated Oberlin College, nonetheless confronted the Tweedy, or let's say the silk stocking as Daddy King called them, Dexter parishioners, with their distrust of emotion and enthusiasm. And he challenged and often mocked their complacency and their aspirations to middle-class respectability. If you ever see a good fight, get into it, was the motto of uh, Vernon Johns learned from his mother. In fact, King, um, and, and now let's move to December 1955, and Dr. King at this point, had to be talked into accepting the leadership of the Montgomery Improvement Association the day after Rosa Parks refused to move from her seat in the front of the bus. And he accepted only after being reassured or maybe tricked into believing that the boycott would be over in a day, 24 hours. King was busy with other things, uh, of course with pulpiteering, but also with trying to write this ambitious plan to revamp uh, the Sunday school curriculum. King counted himself no fan of nonviolence either. Uh, one of my favorite stories about this comes from Glenn Smiley, who was a white um, Fellowship of Reconciliation uh, and, uh, and Presbyterian minister, I think, from Texas, who came to Montgomery in early January of 1956, and in his report back was uh, shocked to have discovered an arsenal in the parsonage on South Jackson Street. When I was in graduate school, King said, I thought the only way we could solve our problems was through armed revolt. But as the boycott slowly unfolded, King began to glimpse a longer road ahead and to reckon publicly and privately with the greater demands of the enlarging protests. He would not be able to get back to this plan to revamp the Sunday school curriculum by week's end, and his dissertation would rely heavily on, you know, unoriginal and often plagiarized material. As days turned into weeks and the boycott entered its second month in January, late January of, of, of the new year, 1956, King, many of you may know, fell into deep despair over his leadership, which he imagined to be a complete failure, and the floundering campaign that had seemed so promising. 
The protests lay in utter disarray, and the fragile unity seemed to be breaking down. But as King told the story in his, his memoir of the, of the Montgomery year, um, Stride Toward Freedom, a vision of Jesus at midnight in his kitchen in this parsonage saying, be not afraid, <laughs> never be afraid, never, never, never be afraid, graced him with new perceptions on the situation at hand. And he also put away the gun. He said, you know, I was so much more afraid in Montgomery when I had a gun in my house. The gun, he concluded, was not only an emblem of fear, but an incubator. And its removal, he believed, cleared for him a wider space uh, for God's will to be discerned. On January 30th, 1956, King was speaking to a standing room only audience at the First Baptist Church, African American, when word reached him that his home, the parsonage, had been bombed. He received the news, as Ralph Abernathy later noted, like a man inwardly prepared for battle, surprising many in the congregation when they learned later what had happened. My religious experience a few nights earlier gave me the strength to face it, King wrote. But by the time he reached his home, a crowd was forming in the street and front yard. Memories of the size of the crowd vary greatly. Some say hundreds, some say thousands. But everyone recalled that the nonviolent protest had reached a breaking point. King, making his way through the crowd, felt the undercurrents of rage that had run strong for years in the community, rising into an immediate threat of, of violence. He overheard one man saying, I'm, I ain't going to move anywhere. That's the trouble now. You white folks is always pushing us around. Now you got your 38, and I got mine, so let's battle it out right now. With the front window shattered and a massive hole blasted into the porch, King was relieved to find Coretta and his baby, their baby daughter in good spirits and safe. Meanwhile, the crowd, still collecting newcomers from all corners of the neighborhood, continued to press forward against the police barricade. King knew he needed to address the people, and he walked into the porch and called for order. He offered the reassurances that Coretta and Yoki, his daughter, were unharmed. Then he said from the damaged front porch, let's not become panicky. If you have weapons, please take them home. If you do not have them, please do not seek to get them. We cannot solve this problem through retaliatory violence. Remember those words, he who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. Remember, that's what God said. We must meet hate with love. Joanne Robinson, in her mar marvelous memoir on the women who started the Montgomery bus boycott, recall that as King spoke, a respectful hush settled over the crowd, and a scattering of gentle amens, God bless yous, and we are with you all the way, reverends, created a new momentum. Tears rolled down the faces of many gathered there as some began to hum church songs. And even the police grew still and listened. King's words and the people's response drew together the parsonage and the street, and wrapped the whole expanse of the Montgomery night into a sheltering peace. King knew all too well that the gathering could have turned into the darkest chapter in Montgomery's history, with hundreds, some say thousands, of angry people surrounding the white middle-aged mayor and his three sidekicks. But something happened, King said, that, diverted, that averted the disaster. The Spirit of God was strong in our hearts, and a night that seemed destined to end in unleashed chaos came to a close in a majestic display of nonviolence. In the final weeks of the Montgomery bus boycott, King told a jubilant audience at the Holt Street Baptist Church, which had just received word that the United States Supreme Court was ruling in favor of the Montgomery protesters. King told this jubilant crowd that while we need to protest 
And while we will need to boycott and while we will need to contest and change the material um, conditions of injustice, the end is not the protest. The end is not the boycott. The end of our struggle, he said, is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. When King boarded the bus the next week, sitting by Glenn Smiley, the white Texas minister, he told the reporter, he told the whole group of reporters, now is the time to move from protest to reconciliation. You know, sometimes I wonder if we um, are not frozen in that moment. Um, but then I, I'm inclined to think that perhaps that moment is our kind of basic condition. You know, the move from protest to reconciliation remains always dialectical, <laughs> a swinging, you know, between the two, neither the one nor the other. An imperfection in which somebody new gets on and somebody else is left off. The excruciating demands of justice and love. I'm almost finished. Three, four minutes. King and the campaigns he led did not in any case move directly from protest to reconciliation. There was a lot of hard work to do. Within the month, he formed a brotherhood called the Southern Christian Leadership Congre uh, Conference. And the next year, he gave up his only full-time pastorate, the one in Montgomery, to redeem the soul of America. But what would that mean? What does that mean, to redeem the soul of America? Did it mean to create the beloved community? And what is that? Did it mean to achieve the American dream, to win in equal rights for the races under the law, to integrate public schools, to realize the coming new order, to consummate history's pulse toward the interrelatedness of all things. For a while, King pursued them all. And at least until 1965, a confluence, this is a wonderful term from John Howard Yoder, the Mennonite theologian, a confluence of optimisms <laughs> enabled him to imagine, King to imagine, a convergence of these hopes in the civil rights movement. In these housing and days of American democratic piety, Christian faith served the cause not as an opiate but as a stimulant, and the mission of redeeming America's soul would rest comfortably in the arms of federal judges and sympathetic legislators. The roaring lion of Zion, flanked by the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution, would march triumphantly towards freedom. And from 1957 until 1965, social progress in America time and again confirmed this great optimism. And always the direction in which the achievement pointed seemed to confirm the hopes. Voter registration, freedom schools, political organizing, crusades, sit-ins, marches, protests, SNCC's disciplined work in southwest Georgia and Mississippi, the martyrs of Birmingham and Neshoba County, the Pentecostal fires of the black freedom struggle scorching clear the ground, and then the Voting Rights Act of 1964 and the Civil Rights Act of 1965 that forever changed race relations in the United States and made us a better nation. The aging legal structures of segregation steady, steadily collapsed under the new framework of federal protections. Yet, <laughs> despite all this, the story of the civil rights movement that runs from Montgomery to Atlanta, from Albany to Jackson, from Rock Hill to St. Augustine, from Birmingham to Memphis, concluded in shattered dreams and crushed expectations. For at some point in that crusade to redeem the soul of America, the coalescence of hope and progress dissolved into the brutal ambiguities of history. And what happens then? What happens when the daybreak of freedom gives way to the cry of disappointment as King poignantly wrote in his last book, where do we go from here? According to Duke theologian Richard Lisher, after 1966, King removed the term 
beloved community altogether from his speeches and sermons, preferring now only the kingdom of God, the biblical reign, the eschatological inbreaking of God in history, in crisis, in judgment. What happens then for hopes of national redemption when those hopes run up against Niebuhr, the intractable contradictions in which human nature is involved. In his righteous, weary 1967 sermon at Riverside Church in New York City, delivered one year to the date of his murder in Memphis, King revealed the fault lines and the chastened vision of history. Renewing his commitment to the ministry of Jesus Christ and placing himself Indeed, in the fierce urgency of now, his words rang out with the searing heat of, of holy despair. He told the congregation that just a few years earlier, during America's shining moment of compassion, there had been a real promise for people of every race. There were experiments, new beginnings, expectations. Then the movement dispersed, and now the storm clouds of Vietnam are casting threatening shadows over the American soulscape, and these many beautiful and courageous exper experiments are abandoned as if they were idle political playthings of a society gone mad on war. SCLC had sought to redeem the soul of America, and yet now King howled a broken-hearted lament that America's soul was poisoned. Hope remains, he said but only in our resolve to recapture the revolutionary spirit and to go into the farthermost ends of the world, <laughs> declaring hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. And in the final year of his life, King turned his attention directly to the economic sources of inequality when he launched the still unfinished Poor People's Campaign, hoping to cast as public theater the tragic realities of poverty in America. And among that extraordinary campaign's demands were full unemployment, a guaranteed annual income, health care for all people, and construction funds for low-cost housing. King had planned to lead a procession of mule carts with a caravan of shotgun shacks loaded onto flatbed trucks from the blighted terrain of the Delta with thousands of people in tow for a pilgrimage to Washington, where the participants would construct a shanty town near federal buildings. And the proposed date for the beginning of the poor people's journey was April 22nd, 1968. Okay, finally. A symbolic solution? Now, surely this isn't the the beloved community, this is, this is perhaps a, a beloved community, King dropped the inclusive we and, infer, and, and, and affirmed instead a radical remnant. The we who will get to the promised land on that stormy night of April 3rd in Memphis was not America. King surely never abandoned the hope of the lion lying down with the lamb, but his hope endured this final eschatological intensification that unsettled his worldly confidences, took him to wit's end, personally, psychologically, and then threw him back on his earliest convictions. Redemption would come as an interruption, not as a continuation. And it was rather in the community of outcast, <laughs> in the church of the outcast of America, that the inbreaking new kingdom could be glimpsed, tasted, and felt. And if one wanted to redeem the soul of America, if one wanted to redeem the soul of the nation, one must turn to spaces of redemption, redemptive action and fellowship, to beloved communities, to excluded neighborhoods, to bold experiments in love, to God movements, to quiet revolutions, 
to free-floating monasteries, as SNCC one time called itself, to infleshing congregations, to nonviolent armies, or to new monastic enclaves on the windswept coast of, of northern Germany, or to a smoke-filled Berlin salon where dissident Lutheran pastors gather around a grand piano singing, Go Down Moses. This outrageous notion that social redemption begins in communities on the margins seems so completely alien to me, us, to the principalities and the powers that, as Bonhoeffer himself wrote in 1933, only one other image might be even more outrageous, namely that Jesus, this man of the ruthless either-or, goes not only to children, but to sinners, traffics with the despised, tax collectors, the deceivers, the prostitutes, makes his home in the church of the outcast. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.